Good morning. Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. My name is Mackenzie. I'm the pastor here and we are so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Last week was Easter Sunday, which means we are still in the Easter season. The Easter season goes on for quite a while, so you'll be seeing white stoles, white paramounts and cloths, and then our lovely Easter banners as well. So I always like to make sure that we all know what liturgical season we're in because I think it's really meaningful to create rich worship experiences as we move through the church calendar together. So we're in Easter season and we'll be here for a little while. Just a reminder that we do have our prayer wall, which is always in worship with us. At any point during the service, you can get up and tie on a prayer ribbon. If you have a prayer request that you would like to be shared with the congregation, you can fill out a card and make sure that it gets to me either before or during the service. Uh, You also could send me an email throughout the week or um, Saturday night. I always check Sunday mornings as I'm prepping my last things. So if you'd like a prayer request to get into me that way, that works too. You might have noticed we have a new bulletin format that we're trying out. So we're trying to cut down on some paper waste and also make things a little bit easier for Joan. So we're trying out this new format. Today is also our Bread for the World bake sale, so make sure you go and check that out during our fellowship hour after church. And Easter season, we have, you know, a new set of liturgy, and we'll also be, during the season, singing our benediction together. So rather than me giving you a benediction, we're going to all bless each other um, each week during the Easter season. So we'll be doing that for the first time today at the end of the service. So just wanted to give you a heads up about that one. And then I believe Adam has an announcement for us as well. Good morning. Um, I just want to invite everyone to uh, our first uh, spring hoedown. It's a a spring party. It's a, a sort of a potluck. Uh, There's a sign-up sheet. It's uh, this upcoming Saturday uh, from 5 until 7.30-ish p.m. Uh, There will be pork barbecue and buns are are provided. We're asking some people to bring some side dishes, and there's a place to sign up for that. Uh, But you don't have to. Just sign up and tell us how many people are coming so we have an idea of who to expect. We have uh, several people that are working hard on games and prizes. We're going to have bingo and a cake dance or a cake walk and... Um, generally encouraging people to wear your best hoedown clothes. I'm busting out my flannel. If you haven't seen that, show up on Saturday. Do we have any other announcements this morning? Okay, then I'm going to invite Mary up to do our call to worship. Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Christ is risen, and he gathers us to worship today. Christ is risen, and he is setting all things right and making all things new. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please stay standing and join us in our first song.
Please be seated. Our call to confession. We are just like the first disciples. Sometimes we have a hard time believing the good news of the resurrection. And sometimes we don't even recognize Jesus' voice when he speaks. But even when we are flighty and flaky, God is faithful. Let us confess our sin so that we might be forgiven. Holy God, because of your love for us, you were willing to die on a cross. You showed us the perfect example of love, but we still can't figure out how to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are selfish, better at hoarding than sharing. We are fearful and judgmental. We build more fences than bridges. We are destructive. We abuse your creation rather than care for it. Forgive us. Even on the cross, Jesus spoke words of forgiveness over those who mocked him. And to us, who keep wandering away, who keep wavering between faith and fear, Jesus is calling out in the voice of the Good Shepherd, saying, Come and follow me. Come and see the good news. It's for you and all creation. Christ is risen. Sin and death are defeated. In Christ, all are welcome. Let's share a sign of this great gift of peace with one another. May the peace of the risen Christ be with you. Let us stand and join together singing, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love.
Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. And remember that the Heavenly Father, to whom you pray, has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. You are cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love for each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. For you have been born again, but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. Before we hear our second reading, let's pray together. O oh God, our creator, we wish to see the risen Jesus. By your Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see him today in your word. God, we believe, but help our unbelief. Amen. Hear these words from Luke chapter 24. Now on that same day, the Easter day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? And they stood still, looking sad. And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have taken place in these days? And he asked them, what things? And they replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen visions of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. And then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead 
as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. And so he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us along the road, while he was opening scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The walk to Emmaus. It's a road that we know very well. We walk the road to Emmaus every time our dreams are crushed and all hope seems lost. As the Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor famously said, it is the road you walk when your team has lost, your candidate has been defeated, and your loved one has died. It is the long road back to the empty house, the piles of unopened mail, to life as usual, if life could ever be usual again. Cleopas and his companion set out on that weary road on Easter morning. It was Easter morning. They had just heard from the women that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was alive. But how could they believe it? Hope was dead, just like their friend. Life as they knew it was over. They couldn't go back to how things were, they had to go on. But how? None of their plans for the future were even possible anymore. They didn't know what to do or where to go, but they had to do something. So they got on the road, and they just started walking. And that is where Jesus met them. In their doubt, in their despair, in their grief and hopelessness and loneliness. That's where Jesus met them. And that is some good news. Jesus didn't wait for them to pull themselves together. He didn't wait for them to tidy up their grief. He didn't even wait for them to trade their doubt in for faith. He met them on the road, right in the middle of all their doubts and all their dread. That is a miracle. That is good news. It's good news for people like us because we too have heard from the women that the tomb is empty. We have heard that Jesus is alive, but that news is hard to believe sometimes. It is hard to believe that Christ is alive and that he's at work redeeming and restoring all things when the world seems to be getting more violent instead of less. When new wars keep popping up and old ones keep raging on. When hatred and disgust against the LGBTQ community is on the rise. When kids go hungry, when racism thrives, when every time we pick up the phone, it seems like it's just more bad news, and when our calendars are full of more funerals than birthday parties. The Easter promises, the very promises that our Christian faith hinges on, are promises that are sometimes hard to believe. 
And like we said last week, we can't force ourselves to believe. The women at the tomb couldn't force themselves to believe in the resurrection. They didn't show up to the tomb with hope in their hearts. But they stayed. And then they remembered. And then they believed. The two disciples walking this lonely road to Emmaus couldn't force themselves to believe in the resurrection either. But their story follows a different pattern than the women's story. Rather than staying, remembering, and then believing, these two disciples meet Jesus right in the middle of their despair. Or rather, Jesus appears to them in the middle of their despair. Right in the middle of their messy, ordinary human lives. These two disciples are on a walk. It doesn't get much more ordinary than that. They are gossiping about all the rumors coming out of Jerusalem. They're complaining and worrying. They're alternately grumbling, moaning, raging, and then going silent as the grief becomes too much to even talk about. And then Jesus is right there, walking alongside of them on the road. But they can't recognize him. Now, clearly, they weren't expecting the risen Christ to appear beside them on the road. But I wonder if they would have known him if he'd shown up wearing dazzling white clothes like the angels usually wear. I wonder if they would have recognized him if a dove had landed on his shoulder or if a voice cried out one more time, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Would they have known Jesus if his face shone like it did on top of the mountain or if he held out his nail-scarred hands for them to hold. Sometimes God shows up in unmistakable ways. Sometimes Jesus' divinity is as flashy as a neon sign in Vegas. But more often than not, Jesus shows up where and how we least expect. Sometimes Jesus shows up on the road while we're gossiping, while we are full of doubt, while our hearts are heavy and scattered with grief and doubt and anxiety. That is what this story promises us, that when we are on the long, lonely, grief and doubt-filled road to Emmaus, that's when Jesus will show up and walk alongside of us. Jesus will appear and he will walk alongside of us, but we might not recognize him. Would I have recognized Jesus if I was on that road? Will I recognize Jesus when he shows up in my life? Those questions started to haunt me a little bit this week, but then I remembered the good news of this story. The good news of this story does not hinge on the disciples' ability to believe or even their ability to recognize Jesus. The good news of this story is that Jesus appears at all. The good news of this story is that even when the disciples didn't believe, even when they heard the rumors of resurrection and dismissed them as ridiculous, Jesus still appeared. Jesus appeared. And he walked and talked with them for hours. Seven miles is a long ways to walk with someone. And still, the disciples did not recognize his face. They didn't even know his voice. And still, Jesus did not abandon them. He just kept walking along the road, he taught them patiently, as he'd done so often before. 
He walked them through the whole story of scripture, explaining how God's rescue plan for the world was always going to unfold like this. That it was necessary for the Messiah to come and suffer before he entered glory. Jesus made it all so clear. He was talking about himself. He was the Messiah. He was the one who had to suffer and die so that the whole world could be set free. And yet still, the disciples did not recognize him. But their hearts burned within them. I've had that feeling when I read a really good book or when I go and see a show and watch a drama unfold on stage. My favorite stories make me want to believe in miracles and happy endings, or at least believe that the way we live our lives matters, that it's worth it to fight for love and joy and justice. Those kinds of stories make my heart burn within me. And I think maybe that's the sort of burning that these disciples were experiencing on the road. They thought that their hearts had turned to stone and ash. But when Jesus appeared and opened up the scriptures, when he taught and preached about God's Messiah and God's plan to redeem and rescue the world, their hearts burned they discover that their hearts are very much still alive, still beating. And now, their hearts are daring to hope again. And it burns. It burns, but it must be a good kind of fire because the disciples are not ready to give up on that feeling. So they say, please, stay with us. Tell us more. Give us more reason to hope. And so Jesus stays. And then he feeds them. When words fail, when even the presence of God beside them on the road isn't quite enough, Jesus feeds them. God's word for us is good. We should look for God in the pages of scripture. We should hope and expect to meet God each time we dive into the word, whether that's on our own, in a Bible study, or here in church. But sometimes when we look for God in the word, we won't be able to hear God's voice. God's presence is good. We should look for signs of Jesus' presence with us on the road and in the mess of our ordinary lives. He'll always be there, but sometimes we won't be able to recognize him. So when words fail, when we can't recognize Jesus, even though he's standing right beside us, even then we are not without hope because Jesus feeds us. God feeds us and looks after us in so many ways. We believe that every good gift is from God. We believe that God looks after us like a good parent looks after their child. Yes, absolutely, we believe those things. But we also believe that Jesus feeds us every time we gather at the communion table. And it just so happens that this is a communion Sunday, and I don't think that it's a coincidence that this Sunday lines up with this text. We are about to be fed by Jesus. So if we, like those two disciples on the lonely road to Emmaus, are too brokenhearted to recognize Jesus, even when he walks beside us, even when he explains the good news, then there is still hope left for us. Because Jesus doesn't just meet us on the road. He goes with us 
all the way to our destination. And then he feeds us. When we feast on this holy meal today, may our broken hearts burn within us. May we recognize Jesus sitting beside us, breaking the bread for us, and lifting up the cup for us. When we feast on this meal that Jesus has prepared for us, may the rumors of resurrection start to turn into reality. Amen. You may be seated.
Jesus is good at feeding his people. On the night before he was arrested and crucified, he served his disciples a meal of bread and wine. After he rose from the dead, nearly every time he appeared to his disciples, he appeared during a meal. He ate fish on the beach with Simon Peter. He ate bread in an upper room to prove that he wasn't a ghost. And after walking and talking for hours on the road with the two disciples on their way to Emmaus, Jesus broke bread and he gave it to them and they finally recognized him for who he was. Friends, every time we eat this communion feast, we too are fed by Jesus. And we too have another opportunity to recognize him for who he is. So let's pray together. God, give us the eyes to see you clearly. Give us ears to hear your good news. Give us hearts open and willing, burning to believe. Meet us here in this feast. Help us to taste your goodness and meet you in a special way in this feast. May we see, feel, hear, and love you all the more clearly and dearly. Just like you have met generations of disciples in the sharing of a simple meal, meet us here today in this meal. Your resurrection is a mystery. Your love for us is a mystery. Your grace and your power and your mercy, it's all a mystery. God, you are the great mystery, and you are worthy of our worship. When we struggle to believe, when our minds can't make the fact line up, when the mystery of who you are starts to feel more frightening than wonderful, God, then comfort us. Turn our fear to awe. Turn our skepticism into wonder and make our hearts burn within us. Help us to see you and taste your goodness every day in the big revelations and the ordinary moments. Ordinary moments like this one where we gather around a table and take a few bites of food. God, transform our ordinary lives into lives spent in awe and in worship of you. Hear our prayer as we say it together, using the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Move not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus fed his friends. While he was among his friends, he took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, and pouring it out, he said, This is my blood, shed for you in the style of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, every time we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the living resurrection of our God. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Friends, this is Christ's table. This is where we taste and see the goodness of God. So let all of God's people, everyone whose heart burns within them, everyone who wants to see Jesus, 
and know him more dearly. Let us all come and feast on this good news. All things are ready. Jesus is here to feed us. Let's pray. Holy, mysterious God, thank you for meeting us in the breaking of bread and in all the ordinary moments of all our ordinary days. Open our eyes to see you walking with us every day. Open our ears to hear your voice in every story. 
Open our hearts to burn for you, that our lives may be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your spirit and the peace of your presence to live as a transformed people, sharing your good news wherever we go. Amen. During our offering time each week, we practice dedicating our time, skills, and resources to God. We do this in hope, trusting that God will use our gifts to serve a world in need. Today, our trays are in the narthex, or you can mail checks in or donate online. Let's pray together. Mighty God, we want to worship you with our whole lives. Send us out from here singing and shouting the good news. Teach us to share your love and hope with neighbors. The gifts we have to share look small in our eyes, but you fed a crowd with just a few bites of bread and fish. Use us and use our gifts to miraculously feed, clothe, house, and love your people. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing song, Day of Arising, hymn 252. So this is our benediction song. Let's sing it together as a blessing and a charge for one another as we go from here to love and serve the God who feeds us. <laughs> 